Welcome to a Blood Moons lesson from Root Source. Root Source allows Jews and Christians to come together and engage directly with each other and share the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. Now, the Blood Moons is one of the most interesting and controversial topics that I've ever seen take a hold of the Christian community. And if we could do one thing well in these lessons, it's not to convince you of anything, but to give you enough knowledge so that you can decide for yourself. Well, my name is Bob, and standing next to me on my left is the CEO and visionary of Root Source, Gidon Ariel. And I'm pleased to call him my friend. So this lesson is a bit of a departure for us because as you might guess from looking at me, I'm not an Israeli Jew. I'm an American Christian. But Gidon suggested that I teach this. Well, the first point I'd like to make in this course is going to be used on the basis of my location. You see, I live in Austin, Texas. You see the star there. Now, when people ask me, uh, where is Austin? I often say, you know, about four hours south of Dallas, depending on how slow you drive, and th about three hours west of Houston. That is a Texas-centric answer. But it's possible to answer the question of where I live from a different perspective. I could say that I live due south of the geographic center of the continental United States. Go to the center, turn south, and you'll run right into us. Now, I'm not sure I've ever answered that question that way, nor have I ever heard anybody else answer it that way. But yet, it is a larger view of where I live. Is your view useful? Well, there's the real point. You see, we will definitely give you a different perspective on the blood moons in this lesson series. Well, the second thing that this... Uh, location gives me the opportunity to do is to ask you a question. Is it really true that Austin is due south of the center of the United States? Well, turns out that Austin is close to, but not exactly on the center line of the United States. If I'm talking to somebody in France, and I, uh, then my description is probably okay. But if you own a helicopter and you're coming to rescue me, and I say, go to the center of the United States, geographic center, go south for a 400 miles, and I'll be there, well, we're going to miss each other by a few miles. So it depends. And... This brings us to our first point, that even in the area of science, there is some wiggle room because things are not precise to the last decimal point. And with the blood moons are full of science, and more than just science, the blood moons are full of history. And more than just history, the blood moons deal with the Bible and what God's word says as the ultimate authority. So within each of these three areas, we need to think about some questions that need to be asked as we continue in this course. Well, thank you for your patience in listening to that background. I hope you will be blessed in this course, and I certainly bless you for your patience. So let's jump into the particular events that are uh, coming up. We have four blood moons and we're in the middle here. Two of them have already occurred. The uh, one in April 15th of last year and October 8th of last year were showing the photographs of those particular uh, total lunar eclipses and there are two more that are upcoming. Some suggestions for how to do that below. So in addition to the four blood moons we have something else interesting that is coming up right now which is a total solar eclipse on March 20th of this year. Now I have a particular reason for including this solar eclipse in this sequence. Uh, we can talk later about 
how solar eclipses are related to these lunar eclipses and whether we should consider them as special or not. Well, let's take a look at in more detail and see about this particular series. If you will bear with me in this lesson, let's take a look at the science and how it fits with the Jewish feast day. So we have the, uh, the lunar eclipses that are falling on Passover and Sukkot for two successive years. And we have the total uh, solar eclipse, which is uh, uh, falling on the religious new year of the uh, Jewish calendar. Now, this is not the civil new year. This is not the time in which the Jewish calendar is going to switch from 5775 to 5776. Uh, this is not Rosh Hashanah, but this is when God originally instituted Passover. God did say this shall be the beginning of the year to, for you. So this is a, uh, it's often referred to as the religious new year. Now let's lay in and show the actual dates. So now we're showing the name of the uh, month on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, and you see that the lunar eclipses are occurring in pretty much the middle of the month. These are dates instituted by God. And that the uh, Nisa and the religious new year is on Nisan 1. So this slide shows what is normal for a given two-year sequence. It is normal to have full moons for each of those feasts, and it is normal to have a bright, shining sun shining down on the religious new year. But the four lunar eclipses in a, in a series are very rare. Over the last 2,000 years, the sequence of a first year and a second year with these four lunar eclipses, it's happened about nine times. Is it possible to have more than four eclipses in a row? No, it is not scientifically possible. Is it possible to have a sequence like this and have less than four? Yes, you can have three, two, or of course, just a, a single uh, lunar eclipse is possible. Well, now let's look at who can see these events. When you have a total lunar eclipse, like we did back in April of 2014, about half the Earth can see it. Why half? Well, anyone who's on the dark side of the Earth while this eclipse is happening can look and find the moon in the sky and see it, assuming it's not cloudy. And then on the next lunar eclipse, you have a, uh, one half of the Earth again, but not necessarily the same half. Why? Because the Earth is spinning and these eclipses don't occur at exactly the same moment. So, of course, across the four eclipses, it, you have a portion of the Earth uh, that is able to see it for each time. Now, who can see this eclipse, the solar eclipse? Well, there's two answers to that. The first answer is who can see the partial portion of it? The par uh, partial is when the moon is partially covering the sun. And the answer to that is about 15% of the Earth, a part of Africa, Europe, Western Russia, and the Middle East, including Israel. It's for about 15% of the Earth. Now, what about the actual totality, this beautiful totality? For a given solar eclipse, only 0.1% of the Earth can see it. It's a very small portion of the Earth that can see this. Well, let's look at this particular path in this case, because we really want to center in on this particular eclipse in this lesson, because it is coming up so close for now. Well, this, its path is almost totally over the Atlantic Ocean. It starts south of Greenland, and it curves up. You can see Europe over here and Iceland there. Uh, you can't really see it, but there's some, the Faroe Islands are right about here with 50,000 people. And as you see this path, as long as you're between the blue lines, you can see this event. Uh, and uh, as you see, it passes some land up towards the top of the path. So let's take a look at that. What island is that? That is an island series called uh, Svalbard. It's off the course, the uh, coast of Norway. Less than 3,000 people live there. Uh, they're certainly getting their 15 minutes of fame in this particular eclipse. Actually, we should say they're getting their two minutes of fame because this solar eclipse is only going to last about two minutes. 
But here is the most interesting part. If you look at the path, see how it's starting to head north? And then it goes off the map. Where does it go? Let's take a look. It starts off the coast of Greenland. And do you see how it's heading right towards the top of the world, the North Pole? And in fact, the shadow does reach the North Pole. All right, so now let's take a look at this animated image. This is uh, repeating here, and you will see just below Greenland, the shadow, it will go past the Faroe Islands, there it is, and then Svalbard, and then up to the North Pole. The larger shaded area is the area that will see the partial eclipse. You see that crossing Africa and Europe and so forth. There it is again. So this is very, very rare. Now, when does it reach the North Pole? Well, it shows here it reaches it on March 20th. Let's look more specifically at the times. The path of the shadow reaches the North Pole at 10:19 a.m. Universal Time on March 20th. Universal Time essentially is the time that it is in Greenwich, England. Okay. And we said something else is happening on that day. And that is that the religious new year begins. Nissan 1 begins, and let's put the time in there. That time, the time of sunset in Jerusalem on that particular day is 3.50 p.m. universal time. Now it'd be 5.50 if you're in Israel, but 3.50 universal time. But that's not the most interesting part of all. I think this is. This day, March 20th, also marks the first day of spring. That is called the vernal equinox. This is the day in which the North Pole begins to have its six month long daytime. In other words, this is the day the sun rises, if you will, at the North Pole. These three events occurring together on the same day, as far as I have been able to research, has never occurred before. Now, I'm talking about just this solar eclipse, a solar eclipse at the North Pole on the first day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, the vernal equinox, the day that uh, all days and nights are equal across the world on that particular day. I checked the eclipse tables that NASA has. I can also say that it is unlikely to have ever happened, and I, I can explain that very easily. Let's do this. You see, pick any spot on the Earth. On average, a location that you pick on the Earth should see a total solar eclipse about every 300 years. I'm talking about the totality, about every 300 years. Now to have that event occur on the first day of spring would be a one out of 365 chance. So you multiply those two numbers and you see that on average, if we pick the North Pole, it should have a total solar eclipse on the first day of spring about every 100,000 years. So this is very, very unlikely, actually much less likely than having four blood moons on feast days. But there's another question, a valid question. Would it be visible? Now let me go back real quick and explain why that is a valid question. You see the total eclipse happens at 1019 in the morning, but spring begins. In other words, sunrise on the North Pole is at 1045, so 12 hours later. So would the sun still be below the horizon? Well, I'm happy to report that this would be visible at the North Pole, even though it occurs 12 hours before spring. The reason is thanks to the Earth's atmospheric refraction, because the sun appears a bit higher in the sky when it's on the horizon than it really uh, would be if we had no atmosphere. So what you'd see is you would see the sun uh, uh, right along the horizon, and then in the second stage, you would see the uh, moon begin to uh, cover it if you had optical aid. And then the uh, total event followed by another partial phase and then 
the sun would be appearing on the horizon again. Now, at all this time, the sun is moving, skimming the horizon, if you will, from left to right. So what we have then on this Earth at the North Pole is a total solar eclipse skimming the horizon for two minutes on March 20th, the first day of spring, for probably the first time in a hundred thousand years. And on the very day that Israel is going to begin its religious new year at sundown. These things combining for the first time ever, it seems. Okay, now for the big question. What does it mean? Well, let me first say what I don't think it means. I do not expect the end of the world on this date. I don't expect the Messiah to return on that date or some other apocalyptic-like event. This is not to say that such an event could not happen. It could, and it could happen before then and after then as well. But could it mean something, especially combined with everything else? I'd like to draw your attention to something the Jewish sages have said about lunar and solar eclipses. They've said that lunar eclipses bear upon the nation of Israel and solar eclipses bear upon the world. And a friend reminded me even today that the North Pole is an international site. Nobody owns it. And if you put a flag there, it's going to drift off in a few minutes anyway. And I would also add that this day combines the world's calendar, the beginning of spring, with the Jewish calendar, the beginning of their religious new year. Now that's something to think about. Exactly what we want you to do. Think about it. When I was recording this lesson and preparing this material today, a verse jumped into my mind. Habakkuk 2.14 For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I never thought about this verse associated with the solar eclipse. But look at the path. It starts in the Atlantic Ocean below Greenland. And it remains in the sea all the way to the North Pole. The North Pole is not land, it's ice. And the islands in the path are small. Could the Lord use this event, perhaps, to increase our knowledge of his glory? And there's another question I could ask. What will you be doing during this North Pole eclipse? I mean, for the two minutes that begin Friday, March 20th at 1018 in the morning, Greenwich Mean Time. What if we were to pray during those two minutes. You know, something like this is a once in a lifetime event. I've been speaking about science today and we're not done with science and we haven't even started with history and the Bible. Oh, and that North Pole eclipse, that's not the only surprise we have left to open, not by a long shot. This lesson was brought to you by RootSource, where we already have more than half a dozen Jewish teachers and rabbis reaching out to teach Christians through video lessons. See you soon.